Good evening, Xavier basketball fans. It's the Raging X Report with Jim Reeker and Bill Gabriel. It is January 29th. We're in the grips of winter here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the Musketeers have fallen to an 11-10 and 10 overall record, standing 3-5 and five in the Big East at this point. We're going to review two games, talk a little bit about the Big East and some issues maybe with the Musketeers, see if Bill has some answers for Coach Steele, and uh, then preview upcoming games and uh, see if we can get the Musketeers turned around. But without further ado, I'll bring in our super analyst, Bill Gabriel. How are you doing tonight, Bill? I'm doing just fine, Jim. How are you? Good. You staying warm out there? I'm doing my best, although it wasn't too bad out today. Not too bad yet, but yes, yeah. Actually, I think uh, look at this part of the country. I don't think it's going to get it as bad as uh, areas just to the north of us. Be really, really frigid. So, well, speaking of frigid, uh, talk about the Musketeers. Um, first of all, last uh, Wednesday night, uh, the Providence Friars came calling. And it uh, looked like the perfect team for the Musketeers to get things turned around, but that didn't happen. In fact, I just read this was the first time Providence had ever won at the Centos Center by a score of 64-62. to 62. What went wrong with the Musketeers against the Friars? Wow. Um, you know, I can't say that when you, you, you look at the the stats that, they were, you know, any one place that you could jump on as far as their shooting um, and, and how they were doing offensively in that game. Um, you know, they they both – actually, both teams made the same number of field goals. Um, both teams made the same number of three-pointers. And Providence got two more free throws on four more attempts than the Muskies did. It's how they got those more attempts that uh, from the free throw line, I think, as well as they got more attempts to shoot the ball because even though they hit the same number of shots, they took a lot more attempts than Xavier did, 61 attempts. And the reason why all that occurred was Xavier had 18 turnovers, and that was a glaring thing that happened in that game was the Muskies could not protect the basketball. And – uh they also gave up 14 offensive rebounds, which I think helped gave, give Providence some extra shot attempts and help them stay in the ballgame. So I think the combination of those two factors just really, you know, doomed the Muskies to not being able to, to get ahead and stay ahead in that game. Yeah, you're absolutely right. 18 turnovers, and uh, they did. They got nine more shots than the Musketeers. So, yeah, much m- many more shots. And 18 turnovers compared to Providence only had 10, and that's just that's a, a recipe for disaster. It's been a problem with the Musketeers. But coming up into this game, we thought, you know, I think they had been under 10. I remember one game they only had four turnovers, seemed to be taking care of the ball. But, uh, you know, and they, they held their star, Diallo, to only 11 points. But, uh, again, it just – this didn't seem like the Musketeers were ready to play. Were they overconfident? I don't know how they can afford to be overconfident in any <laughs> game. I just think that I just think this team is is they're still in the we're figuring out thing. They don't they don't know what they need to do to 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 be successful every night because I don't think they're. They know how it's going to go. It's so nice they have their shots. So nice they don't. And I don't know. I, I think this team can play with anybody in the in the Big East like they have. You know, they played with you know Villanova and much better than they had in the past. And played uh, definitely took Marquette all the way to the uh, to the end of the game almost. And then again, they can turn around and play like they did against Providence. It's like, oh boy, I mean, come on, tell us. Um, and it could be just their youth and, um, you know, people being asked to step into roles maybe they're not ready for. So, Yeah, and just to recap a little bit, it uh, looked like, again, maybe one of those uh, 
miraculous compact victories. They had a couple of those at home already against Butler and Georgetown. But with uh, 53 seconds left, Paul Scruggs hit a three-pointer, made the score, actually ended up the final score, 64 to 62. And uh, Friars tried to bleed bleed the clock down, and they did, but then there was a turnover. Uh, But the Musketeers came down, and Najee Marshall turned it back over with 22 seconds left. Uh, Then again, they created another turnover, but with 15 seconds left, Paul Scruggs came down and had a turnover. I believe that was a travel. Uh, Read or heard somewhere that somebody thought he may have been pushed and maybe a foul should have been called, but again, we're not going to blame the officials. And then again, they had, uh, I believe it was uh, Diallo shooting a free throw with uh, seven seconds left, a one and one, and he missed the front half of that. Uh, got the ball to Scruggs. I don't know if you remember if he rebounded, but he came down and did get a last second shot off at the buzzer that would have counted, but it went uh, off to one side. So the Musketeers played hard at the end like they always do. They never gave up. You've got to give them credit for that. But uh, I think this was this may be the most disappointing loss uh, of a season that so far has had some very disappointing performances. So, yeah, I'm sure that's when they're. Yeah, I'm sure that's when they're ready to uh, to, uh, the, to to the the usual coach speak. Learn from and move on. Yeah, well, we did. We went to uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, unusual Saturday afternoon game. Haven't had many of those uh, this season. With the Marquette Warriors, of course, coming in as one of the front runners in the Big East, they believe they were just a half game behind uh, Villanova. Actually, Marquette and Villanova have not played yet, so they still have two contests, and we'll talk about the Big East. The the two of them have kind of pulled away. This was a game that, um, you know, I think a lot of uh, Musketeer fans, uh, you know, weren't sure about their chances, especially coming out of Milwaukee just a few weeks ago, uh, getting uh, hammered up there and and playing a a really bad game. Uh, But they hung with the Eagles and uh, only had 10 turnovers, so... What went wrong in this game? <laughs> um, I'm not so much sure. As, uh, about the only thing that you could say is they, they cooled off a little bit in the second half from the floor. Um, you know, they uh, they are in the game. Uh, they, they had no turnovers the last five minutes of that game, and they just could not score a field goal. Um, and they were trading their missed field goals for three-pointers made by Marquette, which just uh, – just, buried them um and they themselves cooled off in three-point range i think they were five for nine in the first half three for nine in the second half eight for 18 overall which for you know xavier this year eight for 18 three-pointers is that's one of their high marks um as far as you know percentage wise and, and number made and then um but man they just they just couldn't keep pace with marquette they just like everything they threw up was going in all from the three point line. It was because they shot better from the three point line than they did from the field. They were uh, what fifty? Oh, I had it somewhere fifty eight percent, something like that, from the three point line, and and forty eight percent from the floor. It's crazy. Yeah, and uh, with seven minutes left in that game, Musketeers were up sixty nine sixty three. Seven minutes left in the game. And the next time they scored, uh, actually scored at all, was with 3.08 left uh, when Tyreek hit a free throw. But the next field goal they made was with 40 seconds left in the game. So they went six minutes and 20 seconds without scoring a field goal and uh, just allowed the the Golden Eagles to uh, overtake them at the end. You know, you said something, and uh, this is – something that I I haven't heard or seen anywhere else. You said something at the time when that drought was going on, that they looked tired. And if you look back, uh, the bench was very, very shallow that day. They only went too deep. Uh, Quentin Gooden and uh, Ryan Wellage were the only two that came off the bench uh, for the uh, Musketeers. And you got um, Najee Marshall and Paul Scruggs and even Tyreek uh, putting in some major minutes uh, in that game. In fact, I think Tyreek had 37 minutes in that game. Of course, they played Hankins and 
Tyreek together a lot during that game, which seemed to work well. Uh, you know, that's a positive because there's no way Tyreek would have played 37 minutes last year. But you made a comment they just looked tired at the end of that game, like they just ran out of gas. And it is, you know, are we seeing that the, the, the players on the bench aren't developing, that Coach Steele can't trust them putting them in the game? Is this going to be, you know, things – of the future to come that uh, too many too many minutes for too many guys and, and can't uh, complete the game? Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I would say that with the amount of energy they were expending chasing um, the Marquette players all over the three-point line, because they, you know, they, they pretty much stuck with four guards because I mean, I want, the Hauser brothers are just basically big guards. Um, you know, <laughs> Six they're, nine. They're not, they're, they're, yeah. They're, yeah, but they're not going to turn their back to the basket and do anything. Um, they're going to stay out there and, and uh, chuck it uh, every chance they get. Um, and then, you know, so they're, uh, and they just were out there chasing those guys and they had Howard and um, – uh, was it a, a – a, Amir, oh, I can't remember his last name, but um, uh, Anna, Sakar Anna, yep, yep, Sakar Anna. There we go. Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're chasing those guys all over the place, and I mean, they they worked the shot clock. I mean, a lot of times they took threes with five, six, four seconds left in the shot clock and made them, but. Still, they worked it for a long time. They really made them work on defense, and I, you know, it probably took their legs out of them a little bit, which hurt them on the offensive end. Because now, tired, I'm not running my cuts as hard, um, stuff like that. By the end of the game, that you know, I, I just noticed that it, they looked tired at about that. Well, I can't remember. It was right before the four minute timeout of the, uh, the inside four, and uh, they needed that. But yeah, it was. Uh, they got to have some, you know somebody give them a little relief and, you know, maybe cut some of those guys to to where they're only playing lug in 32, 33 minutes instead of 37, 38, or 40. Um, that might help them. Um, but I don't know if you can trust the bench enough. Um, I just think they're a little shorthanded there this year. And, you know, um, hopefully the, the, the class they have coming next year will help them out for them. But for this year, kind of have to play what you got, and if they got to just play extended minutes, and that's what they got to do. Yeah, uh, Najee Marshall, of course, uh, guarded uh, Marcus Howard most of the time and held him, held him, and I say that not facetious, facetiously, because uh, he had 31 points, but really, you know, he's gone off for 40 and 50 points on certain nights, and uh, he made uh, Howard work for his shots. I did read a national analyst talking about that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize about Marcus Howard is one of his strengths is that he's so well conditioned and he can go 40 minutes, which uh, I think he did sit down a couple times for a few minutes, but he probably had his share uh, close to uh, 36, 38 minutes. But the fact that he can continue to play at such a high level and such a high pace uh, for 40 minutes is what makes him so spectacular. In fact, you remember when they played Creighton in the overtime game, I think he scored 16 points uh, in the overtime to help the uh, Golden Eagles win out there at Creighton. Well, uh, topic that's an interesting topic, uh, kind of, uh, I think you were a little bit surprised. I was kind of surprised that, you know, we, uh, we knew Quentin Gooden was, well, supposedly hurt with a knee although we never really saw that injury supposedly happen up at Marquette during warm-ups. But he, is he still injured? Has he fallen out of favor? Um, I don't know. I watch him. I, I see, I don't know, just kind of doesn't seem to be in it. And maybe we have to remember he was out, what, almost a month at the beginning of the season with the shoulder injury, missed uh, the better part of almost two weeks, I think, with the knee injury. What's your take on Quentin Gooden, and what does he need to do to help this team go forward? What do you see as probably the most important role for him? Well, um, you know, 
since I, I knew that this was going to be one of our topics, I did a little statistical background check so I didn't uh, mess myself up too bad. And uh, I, this is this is kind of interesting. Um, so in uh, makes and attempts from the floor, last year, with all that talent around him, um, guys who could keep the floor spaced um, and uh, catch and shoot players on the perimeter, um, his scoring, he uh, he averaged uh, just below six made baskets a game on about 13 attempts. So he's he's right around 44.5% from the floor last year. He had uh, he averaged about nine, a little over nine assists a game, and had about 4.3 turnovers, only playing about 29.7 minutes, um, which is uh, not too far off where he is right now. This year, however, though, because he lacks those kind of catch and shoot players around him, he's upped his makes to seven made baskets a game, which is really only one about one and a half more baskets, but he's taken almost nineteen attempts. And he's shooting thirty eight percent from the floor. So that tells me that he's probably taking shots he shouldn't be taking in moments um and maybe pressing a little bit. because, um, you know, he was a much better shooter from the floor last year. Um, he's still 8.7 assists per game, so even without the catch-and-shoot players, he's getting about the same number of assists. I mean, he's real close there. His turnovers have only crept up a little bit. I mean, you just think that, man, he had had a boatload the other day, but still, if you look at it over the course of the season, he's he's 4.9 on average, and and these numbers are out of 100 offensive possessions. So he's getting 9.1 assists. Uh, last year in 100 offensive possessions and 4.3 turnovers in 100 possessions. That was, that was a fair way of looking at him. And then he, and this year in 100 offensive possessions, he's 8.7 assists and 4.9 turnovers. But he's getting about 33 minutes a game. So I think what we're seeing is we're seeing him out there a little longer, and he's basically taking more shots, not making some of those shots, that may be in impacting him in other ways, you know, confidence-wise, but his assist and turnover numbers are really about the same. Um, and I, I don't think that I, – it's, I think it's a, it's a confidence issue right now for him. And I think if he starts hitting shots and his confidence comes up, um, I think everything else is going to get better too. Uh, and I, the injuries and stuff like that probably have snuck in there and sapped into that. And, you know, so hopefully for Quentin's case, he can get a little roll going and, and maybe get something going because they need him. I mean, they need him to play w- well and have a large role. And they just can't, you know, he's got to be more than just the same player he was last year for them. Yeah, you bring up a good point, and I almost wonder if, you know, I, I think we even heard this a little bit that he was going to play a different role and we, I think you had even said something. You heard he had worked on his shot a lot in the summer. And I think maybe coming into this season, and maybe he was given the green light by Travis Steele because it seemed like early in the season he was trying to create some of his own shots, three-point shots especially, and trying to be the scorer. And uh, I don't think that's the type of player he is. And it seems like recently, and in fact, if you look at his three-point shooting percentage in the last three games, it's been halfway decent. It's been about 50%. He can knock down the open shot, and I think he needs to when it's there. But I think, and maybe he's come to this realization, and maybe he's even been uh, coached this way, that, you know, you're not a create-your-own three-point shooter. You know, thank God that Paul Scruggs, who's really, you know, he was never, I don't think, thought of as a three-point shooter. But I think I saw today he's shooting – close to 50% three-point shooting, is definitely the best three-point shooter on the team. So kind of a role that he stepped into that I don't think a lot of people thought. But, yeah, I, Quentin Gooden's got to be got to be a contributor to this team, especially as, uh, um, as short as the bench is and the bench that he's on right now. And I think probably not starting has to have some uh, little bit on his, taken away on his confidence. It'll be interesting to see how that goes forward. Of course, uh, 
sometimes you talk about the matchups and the reason why Hankins and uh, Tyreek are both starting. Uh, that's part of it. So in the in the future, you know, maybe we'll see him. I don't know. It's uh, it's hard to understand what's really going on. Um, there was a comment in the press conference after uh, Providence where he had six turnovers, and, of course, six of the 18. And uh, one of the uh, reporters asked something about was, do you think Quentin's still hurt? And Steele said very abruptly, Quentin's fine. He just needs to play better, and he will. Is when, and you kind of put it at an end right there, which I thought was kind of an interesting comment. It made me think that maybe not all is well uh, inside that locker room right now. Um, and again, it's uh, you know, he he. I think he thought he was going to be the leader. I think he's one of the captains, and you know, you're a captain. You're coming off the bench. That that probably has to be a little discouraging. Well, let's talk positive here. What's uh, in your mind? What's the best case scenario for this team going forward? What can they still accomplish that you will feel good as a Xavier fan is like, okay, we did okay? Well, I think, um, you know, I I definitely think they need to win out the rest of their home games. Um, Yeah, I know. That that includes Villanova. That includes a win over Villanova. and I just think that that is something they need to do for, the, for themselves. Um, plus, I think if they pull that off, it helps Marquette out. <laughs> um, because I got a feeling that, you know, that's what Marquette's going to need is somebody to, to to knock them off one game to even them up. Um, and hopefully Xavier's the one that helps them out there. But, yeah, I think they just, they're going to have to win their games at home. It, it, it's it's going to be a challenge to win on the road in this, this conference for anybody. Um, going somewhere else. So, you know, I'd like to say, hey, you know, they win two games on the road out of what they got left. They 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 they, they hold court at home and then they, they, they have you know, they have a respectable showing in the Big East tournament. Um and that's really you know, that that is what I think they need to try to accomplish or hopefully can accomplish for the remainder of the season. Um and then you know after that it's 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 probably uh, you know most likely NIT. I, I hope that's in their future unless they can somehow pull off one heck of a run in the uh, um, Big East tournament and win the whole daggum thing. But uh, that that would be a challenge if they don't take care of the stuff I just talked about because they'll be playing too many days in a row. Yeah, that's a uh, that's probably a, a good point. Uh, and I've seen a lot of chatter out there now that some people are saying the NIT might be a good uh, tournament for this team to have some success in it. In fact, they point out that uh, Marquette actually played in the NIT last year and won, I think they made it to New York to the semifinals, maybe won three games, and maybe that uh, catapulted them into the season. The only thing I think about is those uh, three grad students who I don't think they came here to play in the NIT. And maybe I hold out a little hope, and, and probably the only hope, really, because they have no real quality wins. Uh, in fact, I think the last I looked, the BPI, they got something new, the net or whatever they call it, that they were ranked about 80th in that. And obviously that's uh, not one of the best 64. And sometimes even when you're one of the best 64, at the end you don't make it in because of – uh, conference tournaments that uh, the winner doesn't win or team other teams that get in don't win the tournament, uh, taking away spots. But it, it, you got to think, because you said that they can play with anybody, so I guess the only hope is, you know, I think first of all they got to finish in the top six so they do get a seed where they only have to win three games to win the tournament. And they just have to maybe hopefully at the right time catch a little magic in the bottle and, and, and basically play consistently. Because again, as we said, they've got they go on stretches, you know, for the most part for three quarters of the game. It, more than that, they 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 took care of Marquette, but just couldn't seal the deal. So again, we have to hold out hope that uh, it's a it's a process, and hopefully we're going to get there. Well, let's look yeah. at the Big East standings. It's cr- is it, is this crazy? This is the craziest standings I've seen 
ever, I think. Um, you got Villanova yeah. seven and zero, Marquette seven and one, and eight teams with three wins. Um, three of them with only four losses, five of them with five losses. I mean, Xavier was in. Now they're they're actually if technically you look at it, they're tied for sixth right now. But before this week started, they were in third place, and now you look at the standings, and they actually. Uh, most publications put them at the very bottom because of their overall record being, I think that's the way they do that, overall record being uh, the worst of all the teams. Of course, they played a little bit tougher schedule than a lot of those teams. My que- I have a question here. Is this mediocrity or parity? <laughs> um, I'm going to say that it is parity for most of the teams in – that three win chunk and the parody goes away when you look at Villanova and Marquette, which is why they're where they're at. And I, I'd say it's it's obviously it's Villanova's championship, regular season championship to lose. And it's Marquette's to take. And um everybody else is just gonna fight it out down there and, and for third through sixth, trying to get to where they can play you know, the uh the shorter stretch in the tournament and, and and not have to go the extra day. Um but yeah, I don't think there's I mean you tell me you you know uh, you you know, any of those teams coming in, you're thinking there's none of them that you can just sit down and say, Hey, if you show up and play your your kind of your B game, you're gonna beat them. Uh I don't think anybody in the Big East can say that about any of those teams with those three wins. Um, you know, Marquette has a an off night. They're in trouble. Villanova has an off night. They're in trouble. They're going to get beat because um, there, there's so many good players, and they're young, and they're starting to play better. And at the same time, then they make their youth mistakes, and they're just killing each other. So I, I think it's a lot of parity. Yeah, and we've talked about, too, that uh, of those eight teams at the bottom, a lot of them have a lot of young players. I mean, I think at Georgetown, I think they're starting like three freshmen. Creighton's got a bunch of freshmen. Uh, Tayshawn Alexander, we'll talk about when we talk about Creighton a little bit, but he's only a sophomore in their top scorer. Um, so, and big games on Wednesday. Uh, I talked to my son just last night, and Marquette goes to Butler. And he said he thought they had never beaten Butler since Butler came in the Big East at Butler. So the Marquette fans are really concerned about that. And another game that night, I think might be a surprise, Villanova at DePaul. That DePaul team, uh, watched them within the last week, and they just get better and better. They got a couple big guys that just have really come on, and uh, I uh, – they could be – I could see that as an upset. But, again, like you say, on any night, uh, anybody can beat anybody. And Villanova's not going to go undefeated. I don't know where they're going to lose. But uh, And, of course, them and Marquette still have uh, two games left. Uh, other big games I see – well, Georgetown goes to Villanova on Sunday. Again, they got some uh, good young players. And, uh, and Jesse yeah. Govan, of course, uh, they might have trouble handling him since they don't have uh, a whole lot of size, although Pascal's a, g- a big boy, but he likes to play outside a lot. So it's, um, like I said, I think in the future this is going to be a very strong, I think in two years we're going to see maybe like it was a few years ago where the Big East might be getting, we're talking about six and seven bids again, as they will probably do better in their non-conference and uh, will, you know, be uh, – be a, a conference to be reckoned with, but uh, just lost a lot of stars from uh, last year, and a lot of uh, these programs are kind of in a rebuilding stage and young, but uh, it won't be down for long. All right, let's look ahead at uh, Xavier's schedule. Uh, Georgetown, that was the game we had to come back from 17 points at the Centos Center. What's uh, What are you looking for? Come uh, Thursday night, unusual Thursday night game on the road. Here's the other thing I look at this. The Big East did not do Xavier a favor. You're talking about needing to get off the mat. you got to go to the East Coast on Thursday, 
and to Omaha, Nebraska on Sunday. you got to think they'll get back very late, early Friday morning, and probably hit the road again Saturday for Omaha uh, for that Sunday tip. I'm not quite sure what time that tip is. Uh, that's a noon or two. Okay. So yeah, the Big East yeah. didn't do them any favors there. Two, two tough back-to-back games on the road, and, of course, Creighton's a tough place to play. Anyway, but looking at uh, Georgetown, what do, you, what do they need to do to beat Georgetown on Thursday well, night? First, first thing they need to do is not get down 17 on the road. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that could be uh, not a good thing there. Um, obviously, they know, they know uh, about uh, Jesse Govan. Um, he's just – he's an incredible player. Um, but I'm trying to remember, there, who did not play against them the last time they were here? Was it McClung? Max McClung, who's averaging 13.9 points, and I've watched him play, and he's a problem. <laughs> yeah, he just dropped 27 on uh, St. John's and uh, their uh, win uh, over St. John's over the weekend. Um that's what I thought was it didn't play against Xavier. So that's going to add a different dynamic to that game. And it's going to be a tough one on the road out in the, uh, at Georgetown University there near Washington. And um, they're going to have to, uh, you know, score at an efficient rate and get just enough stops to, to pull that uh, W off on the road. Um, they, they got the experience, haven't played them before, confidence there. But then again, Georgetown has that, if you want to call it the revenge factor, the or you know, oh, we yeah. got to get them on our floor because they got us on there. So um, could be interesting. But you know, they, the Muskies play well; they can do it. Yeah, the Muskies, I'm sure, will be very, very focused. Uh, you know, they've kind of been pushed into a corner here. I think probably Coach Steele has their attention. So. Don't know if they can pull off the win, but I'm sure the performance, the effort will be there as it has been most of the time. Yeah, and before we move, Max McClung, I, I read all this. 6-2, it said he was a highlight reel uh, on uh, his dunks and things, but I've watched him play. I don't know if I've ever seen him dunk it, but he can he can score. He can hit three-pointers. He, he can post up. He's just he, – I don't even know where he's from, but uh, – he uh, he's obviously a great basketball player and is going to be a good one for a few years for the uh, Georgetown Hoyas. And then Sunday out to Omaha, Nebraska, and the Creighton Blue Jays, who if you look at a team, probably if you're going to pick the weakest team in the Big East, I'd kind of maybe pick them. Uh, they don't have a lot, whole lot of size, but they rely on the three-pointer. They're going to they're going to hoist them up. They've already shot 559 three-pointers, and they hit 42% of them, but that's always been kind of their mantra under Doug McDermott is we're going to put up a lot of three-pointers. So what are, the, what are the Musketeers going to have to do to beat them? Um, defend the three-pointer and something they're not <laughs> really good at. Um, Which they struggled, yes. Yeah, I think they're they're like uh, oh, I can't remember what number I somebody I can't remember who said this or where I heard it, but they're they're almost like one of the worst teams in college basketball at defending the three point shot. Um, so hopefully they can find some uh, a lucky rabbit's foot or something. They can go out there and uh, uh, get Creighton to to, to miss some uh, some of those three pointers and. and corral those long rebounds and have them turn into transition baskets because that's what you got to kind of have hope for because yeah they do they light them up and you can't really focus in on one guy and say that's the guy we got to stop because they kind of keep it spread out um and they have a lot of weapons that can hurt you i think they have uh four guys averaging double figures almost five now they do have five guys averaging double figures on those six. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, and even the big man, Krempel, who uh, actually went out with an injury at the end of last season, but uh, he's 6'9", and probably one of their best uh, big men, but he, he likes to go out and shoot the three, too. So I think maybe if the Musketeers do have an advantage, they maybe start the Twin Towers, uh, Hankins and Jones, against them and try to – just basically beat them inside 
and uh, t take them at that. And again, going to have to uh, obviously defend the ball screen and the, the three-pointers. They like to shoot a lot of three-pointers in transition, too. They like to get up and down. Uh, Musketeers actually play fairly well up and down sometimes. So maybe that will uh, play out and be uh, something that will help them a little bit in that game. It's hard hard to tell. All right, you ready for a little trivia? Let's roll. I had a good one, but I couldn't find the answer to it. So maybe <laughs> you know this. I don't know the answer, but I'll throw it out there because I was just thinking about it. When was the last time the Musketeers lost back-to-back -back games at the Cintas Center? Could not, didn't have, didn't have enough time to research that through. I was looking it up and wow. Googling it. Couldn't, couldn't come up with the answer there, but uh, I'm sure. Which is have they? Uh, I almost had that thought, too, but I, got, I had to think in 18, 19 years, there had to be uh, a, some time there when that probably happened. Uh, but uh, along those lines, a little negative tonight, but uh, can you tell me the last time that the Musketeers didn't go to the NCAA? Ooh. Um Let me think. Last time they did not go. That's been a while. Um, that's if you're like me, all the seasons kind of run together after a while. Yeah, I was gonna say. I I, I think they've made it every year. They've been in the Centos, haven't they? Ah, uh, no. Uh, so there was one. Time, I think it was early there, wasn't it? 2012-13, last year in the A-10, they didn't okay. go to the NCAA. They were 17-14. and 14. I remember that year. That was the year, actually, the St. Louis Billikens won the A-10, uh, but the Musketeers did upset them right at the end of the season. I think you were with me at that game. We were mm -hmm. guests of St. Louis University that night. That's right. Uh, Your son was, well, did go there. My son was uh, a student there, so he was invited to a party, which he took us along to. Uh, and then we got to enjoy it because the Musketeers upset the Billikens that night. But the Billikens went on to win the uh, A-10, one of the uh, best seasons they've had in their history, actually. Uh, I think uh, that was after – I think Majerus had maybe just stepped down. Uh, and I'm trying to think of his assistant who took over for a couple years there. I coached Indiana. can't think of his name right now. It come out of retirement. And then before that, it was 2004, 2005. Uh, that was Sean Miller's first year. They were 17 and 12 and didn't make the NCAA. Um, another little trivia I was looking at, because I always think about this, Creighton's one of the toughest places to play. But starting this season, I, I did this research and then uh, – I actually was reading a story. It's actually changed because of their losses in the Centa Center uh, this year. But going into this season, the Centa Center was the fourth toughest place to play or actually had the, the Musketeers are ranked number four in winning percentage in their home uh, arena. And this is per arena. They were number four in the country. After this year, they've actually slipped to number six. Could you guess who, uh, of when they were fourth or even sixth, who would be above them? Higher winning percentage at home. Higher winning percentage at home. Uh, UK? UK was number three coming into the season 89 percent and rep arena and again this goes by arena rep arena uh opened in 1976 so they include all games so obviously the longer a place is open you know the harder it is to keep that winning percentage up because you obviously have chance for more bad seasons so they were number three you probably never will get the two above although i, I knew number one because it's a pretty new arena and the team's been really good since been really good for a while and obviously since the arena opened in 2004 any wild guess at that one 
2004 New Arena, um, and they've been really good. Somebody you don't see play very often because they play really late at night. <laughs> uh, same. Must be out on the West Coast. Gonzaga? Gonzaga. Gonzaga has a 92% winning percentage, or they did going into the season and probably hasn't gone down any. Uh, in their arena, they opened in 2004. Second, kind of a surprise to me, although it's a very new arena, only opened in 2011. That's Oregon has a 90%. Of course, that's that one with the funky floor that has all the uh, forestry all over the floor. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, pretty interesting. And uh, the uh, I think the Musketeers now slid down to sixth as uh, Kansas passed them, Fog Island. That one's impressive. Going into the season, 87% winning percentage since 1955 in Fog Island. And I think the other one that may have passed them was Michigan State, uh, where they play. Well, just a little bit of tidbits here and there, a lot of trivia, trying to relate things. So uh, any final thoughts before uh, we say goodbye to the fans? Um. I was just trying to find if I could locate your your one question about the back to back losses and and looking at just the seasons overall at the home losses, there's only about four seasons where it could have even occurred in. Um yeah. where they had more than, you know, two losses. Um so because um, I would assume if it was just a one or a two they wouldn't have been back they couldn't have been back to back. Especially right. if it was just one loss. So um it's probably it may not ever happen in the Centos. Yeah. Well, you know, with the Big East, it's going to become much more difficult. And we knew that going into the Big East, yep. that, you know, it's a much tougher league than the, the previous two. But, of course, that's what we aspired to, and we are there. And we are still, for another six weeks, we are defending Big East champions. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to uh, lose that mantle this year, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'd like to thank the fans for listening. Th- thank Mike Goodpaster and the Grueling Truth Network and all the platforms he puts us out on. And uh, we'll finish as we always do by saying, Go Muskies. Go Muskies. <laughs>